Welcome again uh, to this Landmark Chambers uh, webinar, the uh, NPPF case law update. Um, we have um, developments in the courts on the NPPF occurring still with frequency, even in the current circumstances, the admin court and the court of appeal are, are still sitting in many cases. Um, <clears throat> there are five of us speaking today on this subject. My name is Rupert Warren QC. I'm one of the joint heads of chambers at, at Landmark and I'm a planning specialist as some of you uh, may know. Um, I also had the uh, honor, pleasure uh, of advising on the MPPF when it was being written in, in 2012 and also in 2018 and 19. Um, uh, I'll be chairing uh, today's session. I'll be joined by four colleagues who I shall introduce in just a moment, but can I cover first of all, just a few housekeeping points very briefly. Your uh, microphones will be muted throughout the proceedings, which will be recorded. Uh, the recording and slides uh, will be available uh, after the event is finished. Um, there is a, a question and answer button that you will have seen, some of you will be familiar with its function uh, in the strip at the bottom of your screens. And you can post during the proceedings any questions that you'd like us to answer at the end. And we'll pick up as many of those as we can in that uh, 15 minute or so session at the end. If there is some that we can't manage to fit in and we think we've got something useful to offer on, then we'll, we'll put those uh, additional points in a paper for you and, and publish it uh, along with um, the, the other materials after we, we've finished. Um, if you at any point um, fall out of the webinar, there's an interruption in your feed or whatever, just click on the same link that you use to access uh, the webinar to begin with and you should come back in. Um, we're not charging, as you know, for this webinar. We, we've got into a habit recently of, of asking people if they want to reflect uh, anything to, to, to make a contribution to NHS Just Giving on their main um, website. Um, and so I'd encourage you to do that. So there are um, four speakers today. Um, let me introduce them briefly. And then as we get going, we'll just go from one to the other without me intervening again to introduce them one by one. Um, our first speaker today um, is Alistair Mills. Um, he is a planning specialist uh, as well as practicing in, in other areas. Um, and he is the author of a book which some of you may, may have called Interpreting the MPPF. Uh, he's also the main writer of the digest that you will have seen on the MPPF case law on Landmark's website. And there is a new version of that, which is available dealing obviously specifically with the recent cases on the 2018-2019 reissue of the MPPF. And he's going to be talking to you about uh, tricks of the trade, if you like, in interpreting uh, the, the MPPF. Um, he will be followed uh, by David Blundell QC, who is a planning specialist and a public lawyer. And he's going to be talking about cases about the presumption about paragraph 11 and the surrounding paraphernalia of, of the presumption in favor of sustainable development. He's going to be doing it by way of a recorded presentation because ironically he's trapped in the court of appeal, no doubt arguing about the interpretation of the MPPF. So he can't be here, it's run over till today, but we, he's kindly recorded it for us and obviously we'll try and deal with any questions that arise uh, on it. Um, he will be followed by James Marici QC, known, to, I suspect, to all of you, a leading planning silk. Um, he also represented, as did David, uh, the government for many years in the High Court, the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court on planning matters, uh, and has been involved in a number of high profile cases uh, on the interpretation of the framework. Uh, and finally, we have, uh, we will have Hannah Gibbs, um, who um, 
I think we've lost Rupert. Uh, technical uh, hitch. I know he was having some issues. Um, uh, the introductions. Um, our, our last speaker uh, is, is Hannah Gibbs, and Hannah's going to be talking um, uh, about Greenbelt after Samuel Smith. Uh, Hannah appeared in that case uh, in the Supreme Court with um, Dan Kalinsky. Um, I think probably what we better do is uh, we better start the uh, presentation. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Alistair. Well, thank you very much indeed, and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's uh, good to good to see you all, or to be with you all uh, as as best we can at present. And um, I'm not going to be talking about a, any specific topic in relation to the NPPF. Now, now by that, I, I I don't mean to say that I'm just going to be droning on at random about any old topic. Although maybe that uh, at the end of my presentation, that is the conclusion that you will reach. But that's a matter for you. Uh, no, I'm going to be um, speaking about. Um, having looked at uh, many, if not all, of the uh, main cases on interpreting the NPPF, uh, what are some of the uh, lessons we can learn about interpreting uh, this document generally? Uh, what can we uh, what can we see um, are some uh, ways that the court uh, approaches the framework? Uh, and this may be helpful, uh, for instance, in circumstances where there isn't a decision so far on the interpretation of, of, of that aspect of the framework. Um, how might we think uh, that the courts may turn to the interpretation of it if, if, if it's a new question. Um, so um, we're, we're going to look at um, a, a, a few different uh, issues in relation to the interpretation of the framework. Uh, and firstly, um, a topic which I'll call um, I mean what I say and I say what I mean, uh, which I think may be a paraphrase of something the Mad Hatter said. Uh, and uh, the first uh, the first case um, is <clears throat> a, a decision of the High Court uh, called uh, James Hall on the topic of heritage. And um, it, it was it was argued in that case that the officer report, uh, the local planning authority um, officer report, um, had reached a conclusion that there had been minimal harm in heritage terms. There'd been minimal heritage harm. Now, um, no, uh, said uh, the, the High Court, there is no category of minimal harm uh, in heritage terms in the NPPF. There are only three categories. Uh, either there is no, har no harm in heritage terms at all, or there is less than substantial harm, or there is substantial harm. The NPPF doesn't have any other categories, uh, and so it's not up to decision makers and it's not up to courts to create other categories. Uh, the um, less than substantial harm category uh, in the NPPF is very broad, but that doesn't mean that there, uh, other, other categories should be invented. A second case um, also uh, suggests that the NPPF uh, means what it says uh, and, and no more. Uh, this uh, case was about uh, retail policy, a case called Asda Stores, uh, and it was suggested in that case that one of the retail uh, elements in the NPPF created a presumption, a presumption against certain types of development. No, said uh, the High Court, um, just, as, just as Gandalf in the Lord of the Rings says there is only one Lord of the Rings and he does not share power, in the NPPF there is only one presumption uh, and there are no others. That is the presumption in favour of sustainable development. Uh, the NPPF uh, makes it clear when there are presumption when there is a presumption uh, and that um, it does so expressly and there wasn't one here. Um, turning then from the Mad Hatter to Humpty Dumpty, uh, he um, he said, "Words mean what I want them to mean, uh, neither more nor less." Uh, and that is that's an approach which uh, the courts have um, completely rejected in relation to the interpretation of planning policy. Um, it doesn't matter what a uh, what the Secretary of State um, in making planning policy thought uh, he was doing. What matters is what the courts say that policy means. So uh, the interpretation of policy is a matter of law. That's uh, well established now. And in terms of the framework, uh, Lord Justice Sullivan in the Red Hill Aerodrome case said, the framework means what it says and not what the Secretary of State would like it to mean. That said, we do have a number of cases where we see um, an interesting uh, way in which the uh, Secretary of State uh, is, is asked to be involved or whether or not the Secretary of State is involved can be relevant to the way litigation is run. Uh, 
So uh, in a case called Watermead, the Court of Appeal, um, uh, an issue uh, was raised uh, in, in relation to the interpretation of the framework, but the, the Court of Appeal said, well, it, it's not necessary for us to determine that. And, and what's more, the sector of state wh whose policy this is, isn't actually before the court, so we won't answer it here. The same issue, the same uh, point to be interpreted, then arose shortly afterwards in a case called East Staffordshire. Uh, and in that case, the Court of Appeal noted, oh, well, we now, have the we now have the Secretary of State before the court. We now have the Secretary of State's view. More recently, uh, in the Asda Stores case, uh, the Secretary of State was invited to give representations, to give submissions um, as he, uh, on his view as to the uh, correct interpretation of the framework. Now, that was a case in which the Secretary of State wouldn't otherwise have been involved because that was a challenge to a local authority's decision interpreting the NPPF, but the Secretary of State was invited by the court to get involved. And very recently, I think it was in the last week or two, um, there was a, a decision in a case called Wiltshire Council against the Secretary of State. In, in that case, the Secretary of State had decided to concede that the inspector's decision contained an error uh, and therefore didn't uh, contest the claim. Nevertheless, the Secretary of State was told that they had to turn up to court, uh, a barrister had to turn up to court to represent the Secretary of State. Uh, it, uh, given that there was an issue of the interpretation of national planning policy. Uh, that said, um, uh, having done so in the judgment, the Secretary of State is then told, well, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter what you wanted to do in terms of this policy. What matters is what it, was, is, um, <clears throat> is, is what it, it, it said, which uh, seems to me a bit like uh, somebody calling up someone and then saying, oh, actually, I don't want to speak to you after all, um, asking the Secretary of State for their views and then saying, well, it doesn't really matter. Um, moving on to our next topic, what about uh, the relationship between the framework and the planning practice guidance? Uh, no doubt uh, most, if not all, are very familiar with these uh, two, di uh, two different documents. Uh, they are quite different. They both come from uh, uh, central government, but the framework uh, published, um, easily printable out, uh, consulted on changes, as opposed to the planning practice guidance, an online uh, suite of guidance which changes quite frequently um, and contains uh, a lot of quite uh, technical guidance or some, sometimes it's summarising the effect of legislation. Uh, it's, it's suggested in one case, a case called Solo Retail, um, Interestingly, in this case, it's, uh, I haven't been able to find it online, but it is referred to in a subsequent case, which is, which is on the next slide. Uh, in, in solo retail, uh, it was suggested by the judge that there is a different approach to the interpretation of the NPPF and the PPG, or at least there may be, given the differences between uh, those two documents, the PPG being an online suite generally without consultation, uh, changes are brought in, changes are brought quite frequently, uh, and that, the court said, may suggest, may um, um, and change uh, the way in which the court interprets it. It may take a less um, uh, court focused, um, it may take a um, in, uh, way of interpreting that document and it may be more up to the way the decision maker um, seeks to interpret it. Um, that said, the Court of Appeal uh, in a uh, case called CPRE Surrey, that suggested that the approach to the interpretation of the NPPF and the PPG is the same. Uh, and uh, in a High Court decision uh, called CEMEX, that says, well, in terms of material planning considerations, um, national planning policy, uh, which uh, includes um, uh, the PPG, the, these are material considerations par excellence. Um, and um, there, there was no distinction drawn in that sense between uh, the PPG and the NPPF. So how do we reconcile these cases? Well, I think that one way of reconciling them may be to say, well, the PPG sometimes includes policy, but sometimes it's just it's just guidance. Sometimes it's just a, a summary of legislation or very technical guidance. Um, where, however, uh, it is expressing national planning policy, uh, you may well remember that it used to do so, for instance, in relation uh, to prematurity. In those circumstances, I think the better view is probably uh, that the courts will take the same approach that it is up to them to interpret its meaning. Uh, what then about some lessons we learn from uh, the interpretation uh, of the NPPF in terms of officer reports, in terms of challenges to decisions of local planning authorities? Well, in the uh, CPR, uh, CPRA against Herefordshire case, uh, it was said that the duty in an officer report to give reasons for a recommendation, that doesn't necessarily require the explanation of the interpretation of policy. That may be the music to the ears of uh, 
of planning officers um, aware of all these decisions saying uh, pouring over how uh, policy are interpreted by decision makers to say well you don't necessarily need to give an explanation of the interpretation you have reached that um, that that may be some comfort uh, then two cases to contrast uh, a case called Bromwell and a case called Irving uh, in the Bromwell case uh, the, the High Court said, well, it's not necessary in the office reports to set out any every relevant provision of the NPPF. By contrast, uh, in the Irving case, uh, it was said that uh, if an officer report refers to some, but, but only some, of the relevant development plan policies, then that may be liable to mislead. Now, I think there's an interesting question whether or not the distinction between uh, those two approaches depends on whether it's national policy or development plan policy, or, or maybe it's just because of, uh, on the facts of those cases, the, the materiality of the different uh, uh, policy uh, uh, differed as between those cases. I think that remains to be seen. And then finally, in relation to officer reports, uh, it's worth noting what Sir Duncan Oosley said in the Safe Rottingdean case. Uh, there was a suggestion before him uh, that it was necessary only for a claimant in a challenge um, to uh, raise a serious issue or to, um, to, to indicate a, a strong suggestion that there'd been uh, an error in terms of interpretation uh, by uh, in an officer report. No, said the High Court, it, it's actually for the claimant to demonstrate that there was an error, not just to suggest that there may well have been one. Uh, then uh, the uh, difficult topic of changes in policy. Uh, it's been uh, fairly recently reinforced that uh, in relation to changes of policy uh, and taking these into account, say for instance if you have a resolution to grant by a, a, a committee of a local planning authority and then there's a delay uh, before the actual grant of planning permission, what if there's a change of policy there? Well the court said well it, it's not enough that there is a material uh, change in policy uh, as in you know there's some sort of significant change in policy that change in policy actually must be material to the decision and in the Hudson case uh, last year the, the although there was <clears throat> uh, a change in policy which was important it, it actually made no difference to how uh, the application would have been considered anyway so it wasn't material to that decision. Uh, then the tricky topic of um, to what extent we look at previous versions of policy. Uh, one thing which I find quite interesting about the Supreme Court's decision in the Samuel Smith case, which Hannah's going to be talking about later, is the extent to which Lord Carnworth um, in, in the Supreme Court looked uh, back at the history of Greenbelt policy. Whereas uh, the um, High Court decisions in, in relation to the interpretation of the NPPF say, well, we don't want to have to trawl uh, through uh, the previous versions of the NPPF to, to interpret the present one. Don't say, oh, well, you know, there's a new semicolon here, which wasn't there in the last version. Just interpret uh, the current version uh, as it is. Uh, so um, those are some uh, little tips and tricks which I've picked up from uh, reading uh, many NPPF interpretation cases. Uh, but we're now going to turn away from uh, that to, um, to some specific topics in, ter in terms of the interpretation of the framework. Uh, and firstly, uh, the very vexed topic of the presumption in favour of sustainable development. Uh, and uh, we're going to hear uh, from, uh, from David Blundell now. Hello everyone, my name is David Blundell QC and I'm going to be talking to you today about the uh, presumption in favour of sustainable development in the MPPF. I'm sorry that I can't be doing this live, I'm afraid I'm tied up in a Court of Appeal case which has spilled into a second day, so I'm afraid this part of the webinar is even more remote than would otherwise be the case. Uh, as you all know, of course, the presumption in favour of sustainable development is contained in paragraph 11 of the current NPPF. And there have been many cases already uh, in the courts about its interpretation and application. I'm going to be focusing today on five of the cases uh, of significance in the last year or so. Uh, and I've set out on this slide what those cases are. First of all, there's the Wavenden Properties decision of Mr Justice Dove. Then I'll be moving on to the Monk Hill decision by the head of the planning court, Mr Justice Holgate, important decision on the interpretation of the MPPF overall. Then I'll be moving back to Mr Justice Dove for the Peel Investments decision, followed by Sir Duncan Oosley commenting in the Paul Newman decision uh, on the operation of paragraph 11. And then finally, to round things off, uh, going back to the head of the planning court, Mr Justice Holgate, in the Gladman Developments decision. 
So without further ado, the Wavenden case. So the background facts are that this involved an outline application for planning permission for 203 dwellings. And perhaps the most significant part of the case in terms of the factual background was that in post-inquiry submissions, the parties both produced evidence which demonstrated that there was no five-year housing land supply. This was a recovered case and the recommendation from the inspector having considered that evidence was that uh, the um, appeal should be allowed and planning permission should be granted. Notwithstanding that, the Secretary of State differed from uh, his inspector and how the planning permission should be refused. The key question, the key argument um, or principle that comes out of the case is whether paragraph 11D means that every one of the most important policies must be up to date before the tilted balance is disengaged. Uh, Mr Justice Dove came down firmly in favour of saying no uh, in response to that submission. And his uh, judgment is of interest because of the three part analysis which it adopts to this question. So he said, first of all, uh, you have to look at, at, at to establish which policies are the most important ones for determining the application. So that involves a question of planning judgment and assessment. Secondly, you have to examine uh, each of the policies to decide if it is out of date. And doing that involves applying the terms of the MPPF itself, as well as the now well-established approach in Bloor Homes. And then thirdly, the final stage of the analysis is to form an overall judgment as to whether or not the basket of policies which you have identified is out of date. As I say, applying that three-part test, he came down clearly uh, in favour of saying no to the submission that had been made. And he said it was important in examining these questions uh, to remember that paragraph 11 was designed to shape and direct the exercise of applying judgment. You'll see as I go through the cases, that this is a theme really in these five cases that comes out of them. Perhaps another point of interest in the case is that although the Secretary of State won on the point about the interpretation of paragraph 11, ultimately he lost the case because of a reasons challenge. The Secretary of State hadn't given proper reasons for disagreeing with his inspector. So a demonstration there that sometimes the old arguments are the best ones. So the second case I'll look at is the Monk Hill decision of Mr Justice Holgate. This looks at what is now termed the asymmetric tilted balance. So the case concerned an application for planning permission for 28 dwellings uh, in the grounds of a former country house. Most of the site was in um, an AONB and the remainder was uh, in an area of great landscape value. The issue, the sort of core issue in the case, was whether or not uh, a policy can fall uh, within paragraph 11D1 um, uh, only if it's expressed in language whose application may provide a clear reason for refusal. Here, the policy in question was paragraph 172 of the MPPF. The real importance of the case, uh, though, lies in the comprehensive analysis of the approach to the interpretation of paragraph 11 that Mr Justice Holgate um, set out in paragraph 39. Um, he began in the paragraph before that by stressing that the MPPF policies had to be uh, interpreted in a straightforward manner on the basis that they were designed to guide or shape practical decision making. So an important, important statement of principle as to how to approach the interpretation of MPPF policies. Then in paragraph 39, he set out 15 points of interpretation, which uh, he said he, he uh, developed uh, from the cases which had been used to interpret the MPPF. I've set out some of the key features there uh, under the findings heading in this slide. One of the most important ones, I think, is the sort of back to basics finding that the presumption in paragraph 11 doesn't displace the operation of section 38.6 of the 2004 Act. He also um, conducted a very important analysis of the interaction between uh, limbs one and two in paragraph D, making the point that you have to examine the limb one first, that's very important, and that it was the application of policies that, was a, that mattered in limb one, not just their engagement. Um, also some very important consideration given to the interaction of those limbs with section 70, subsection two of the 1990 Act, and again, section 38.6. The consequence of all of this, what Ms. Justice Holgate described as the ineluctable consequence, 
was that there was an asymmetry in the tilted balance and when it would or would not be engaged and effectively it might be engaged rather less than people thought it would be. He said this was an inevitable consequence of the drafting of the policy. I said that paragraph 39 is very important for setting out those 15 points of interpretation. Uh, there's also a very useful sort of mini summary at paragraph 45. So very, very important case there for generalised approach to the interpretation of the MPPF. The third case I'm going to look at is the Peel Investments case. Uh, this involved two applications for planning permission in Salford, in the Salford region, uh, both involving fairly large scale residential development, 600 dwellings, uh, a marina as well. And the key argument here uh, before the High Court was whether or not saved UDP policies were out of date once the plan uh, period had ended. That was the argument advanced on behalf of the development and again on behalf of the developer and again Mr Justice Dove gave a very firm answer to that question he said that was not correct. The case is useful in part because Mr Justice Dove carries out a very helpful analysis of lots uh, of the MPPF case law on out-of-date policies uh, but he then goes through the factors I've identified here so he begins by examining um, uh, the case law and finding that whether policies were out of date was a question of interpretation of planning policy itself, specifically and especially of MPPF paragraph 11D and also paragraph 213. He went on to find that nothing in the MPPF required policies to be treated as out of date after the end of the plan period. Indeed, it was rather more than that. That sort of approach would be contrary to the MPPF itself and specifically paragraph 213. He emphasised again that the Bloor uh, judgment had to be applied in determining whether a policy was out of date and this would often be a mixed question of fact and judgment. And in that regard, the fact that um, a saved policy was in place after the end of the plan period would be relevant but not dispositive of the issue. That's important because again it means that uh, a decision maker has to decide what weight to give to a policy in that situation, again emphasising the significance of planning judgement in this whole exercise. So a very important decision there, what out of date means. The fourth case is the Paul Newman uh, decision. Uh, this was a decision by Sir Duncan Oosley and involved an application for planning permission for 50 homes in the countryside. And the question here was whether a single development plan policy uh, could constitute the basket of policies for the purpose of paragraph 11d. Stunken Oosley, perhaps uh, unsurprisingly, found that the answer to that question was yes, at least in principle. The interest in the case really lies in Sir Duncan's examination of the triggers, the two triggers in paragraph 11d. So he examined the first trigger, um, whether there were um, relevant development plan policies, and he considered that the interpretation of that particular phrase was quite clear. He said where there was one or more um, relevant development plan policy existing, the trigger did not apply. So one policy was sufficient and of interest, it didn't have to be an up-to-date policy. Second trigger, on the other hand, was also reasonably clear. Um, the policies, again applying the Wavendon approach, policies that were applied outside the plan period because they were saved were not by virtue of that fact alone. Uh, irrelevant and uh, uh, they couldn't be ignored. So a very interesting decision on the two triggers in paragraph 11d and also interesting for some of the tensions that Stunken Oosley uh, identified between trigger one uh, and trigger two. Uh, so a very important decision. The final case uh, I'm going to look at is the Gladman case and I, I've uh, titled this slide Back to Basics because again, it's quite an important decision for looking at some of the basic concepts uh, and approaches to be adopted, specifically as regards paragraph 11, but also generally as regards the MPPF for 240 dwellings. And in neither case was there a five year um, housing land supply. The question, the legal question uh, in the challenge was whether development plan policies were to be ignored when applying the tilted balance in paragraph 11D2. 
Again, very clear answer from Mr. Justice Holgate. The answer was no. This was a rolled up decision. And he found that it was still necessary under paragraph 11 D2, even where the tilted balance was engaged, to consider relevant development plan policies. The MPPF didn't prescribe the weight to be uh, ascribed to those policies. So that was an exercise that the planning decision maker still had to carry out. Uh, and just because there was a deemed shortfall uh, of housing, or just because there was a shortfall of housing, meaning there was a, a deemed out-of-date policy, uh, didn't bring an end to the process. One still had to examine the nature and extent of the shortfall, the reasons for the shortfall, and for example, um, the prospects of it being reduced. He also went on to find that paragraph 11 D2 operates in three different scenarios. First of all, where there are no relevant development plan policies, Secondly, where the most important plan policies are out of date. And thirdly, where there's a deeming um, through a housing shortfall. Uh, and again, through all of this, he stressed the importance of still applying the planning judgment to determine what weight to give the policies, to be given to the policies uh, that were relevant in that exercise. So if there's a theme really to come out of those five cases, and I've obviously gone through them at breakneck speed, it seems to me it's first of all an emphasis on avoiding excessive legalism in the interpretation of paragraph 11, of course the MPPF as a whole. Secondly, a need to avoid throwing the baby out with the bathwater in a sense. In other words, it's still necessary to apply paragraph 11 subject to uh, section 72 of the 1990 Act, section 38.6 of the 2004 Act. So back to basics. And thirdly, there's a real emphasis on the continuing role of course of planning judgment in the assessment to be made when the tilted balance is applied. So again, it's not an easy shortcut, as might otherwise have been thought to be the case. I hope that's been of some assistance, uh, and thank you very much for listening. Uh, hello. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm James Marici QC. I hope you uh, enjoyed um, David's uh, talk. And uh, just to emphasise, uh, if you do have questions, uh, in relation uh, to David's uh, talk, please do uh, send them through and we will uh, seek to answer them uh, either this morning or in a subsequent um, uh, paper. So I'm talking to you um, today um, about housing uh, cases um, and um, I'm obviously not going to cover the um, presumption uh, which um, David has already covered, I'm going to deal with other housing uh, cases. So um, I'm starting, uh, in terms of um, scope, I'm really looking at cases mostly that fall within section five of the MPPF. Section five has some of everybody's sort of favorite paragraphs, uh, 59 on boosting the supply of homes, um, 73 to 76, which include the important obligation to have a five year land supply, but also, of course, that basket of policies, which includes dealing with things like affordable housing, identifying land for homes, uh, and also uh, rural housing. So the cases I'm going to look at are on paragraph 59, the Crondall case, on paragraph 73, uh, three cases, including the Peel case that David spoke about, but looking at it from a slightly different perspective. Uh, one case on paragraph uh, 79 uh, on, on rural housing and isolated homes. Uh, and then I'll finish with a very brief mention of a case that touches on the uh, Annex 2 glossary definition of affordable housing. I'll start with Crondall. Crondall's better known as the case on habitats and the fallout from the utterly ridiculous decision of the European Court in People Over the Wind. But you better not get me started on that. As some of you know, uh, I can speak for hours uh, just on why that decision is so appallingly bad. Um, but interestingly, in that case, uh, one other point arose relevant to housing and housing policies uh, in the MPPF. Uh, it focused on the interpretation of paragraph 59 of the MPPF. It's a short but quite important point because um, it was said by the court that the inspector was entitled to conclude, as he did, that the policy objective of significantly boosting the supply of homes contained in paragraph 59 did not cease to apply when housing land supply in excess of five years could be established. Now, that may seem uh, self-evident and obvious, but I think as many of you know, um, it's not that rare for a third party and indeed rarely, I suppose, more rarely um, a local authority to try and make arguments along those lines that if there is a five-year land supply, uh, 
uh, that for some reason that objective is not uh, in play. So useful if short point in relation to that. Moving on to paragraph 73 cases, first of all, Tewkesbury, um, 40 dwelling scheme. Uh, obviously one of, the, one of the issues was, could the council show a five year land supply? The inspector rejected uh, the local planning authority's case that an oversupply of housing land since the start of the development plan period should be counted in calculating five year uh, land supply. He considered that the oversupply from the previous years, you couldn't, couldn't be banked so as to reduce the housing target in future years. And he concluded then that there was no five year land supply, the presumptions applied from paragraph 11, but he still went on to refuse planning permission. And this led to the unusual situation where the local planning authority sought, despite winning the appeal, to judicially review, they couldn't use section 288 because they'd won, to judicially review the inspector's findings on five year land supply on the basis that there was an important point of interpretation of the MPPF that arose. Now, um, the court dismissed the case uh, on jurisdictional grounds, uh, saying that uh, where you have a section 78 appeal, uh, a successful party uh, isn't going to be able uh, to uh, bring a judicial review challenging the interpretation of policy uh, that they don't uh, like. And uh, you'll see the language that's used by the judge. Having lost that particular uh, battle, but won the war in relation to the outcome of the appeal, I do not consider that the principles in relation to dealing with such an academic judicial review uh, are engaged. I mean, of course, in the real world, um, it's not an unimportant issue for a local planning authority. Uh, even though they've won the appeal, if they've lost them five year land supply, obviously, as we all know, that has big consequences for them beyond that. Uh, but that is uh, literally just a risk that the local planning authority is going to have to take in fighting uh, an appeal. Um, and I just draw attention to this. This is not actually from the findings of the court, because the court obviously dismissed the case on jurisdictional grounds. But the court recorded some of the submissions made on behalf of the Secretary of State, um, uh, including this. That, uh, and this fits with one of the themes in Alistair's talk about not um, uh, adding or seeking to add uh, things that are not actually in uh, the um, uh, MPPF. And so you'll see it's so the MPPF and PPG are completely silent on the issue of whether or not a, an oversupply should be taken into account when calculating the five-year requirement. And because the task of the court, so the Secretary of State said, was interpreting policy, not creation of the policy, by filling gaps where policy might have been uh, created, uh, there was, in the present case, it was said by the Secretary of State, no policy to interpret. There were a number of potential approaches which could be taken by a policymaker in relation to how they treated oversupply. But it wasn't the job of the court to select that policy approach to fill a gap in what the MPPF says. And in the absence of any text to interpret, there was no interpretation to perform. There was nothing in the MPPF, nothing in the PPG. Uh, that matter was a matter for the decision maker subject to uh, the facts of the particular uh, case. So that kind of in principle issue about whether you can take oversupply uh, earlier on in the plan period into account in, in, in calculating the requirement isn't answered by the MPPF and the Secretary of State's view appears to be that it's one decision maker can take different views on. Then Peel, Peel was one of the cases you uh, heard earlier that David dealt with. Um, the uh, claimant um, alleged the inspector had erred uh, in finding the local planning authority was able to demonstrate a five-year land supply for the purpose of paragraph 73 because it was incorrect um, to rely purely on the mathematical quantification of housing land supply because on the facts it was said that there was within the area a qualitative housing land supply shortfall uh, in terms of a deficit of large family aspirational homes as well as in relation to affordable housing. Uh, so does the five-year land supply go beyond quantitative to include uh, qualitative? Answer from the court very clearly, no. Uh, calculating the five-year land supply in accordance with the MPPF is something that's undertaken on a quantitative only uh, basis. Um, it is not something that encompasses looking at the qualitative and what the shortfalls might be there. Albeit that, of course, there being a shortfall of qualitative, um, of qualitative nature in relation to housing was something that could be relevant in the overall planning balance, but it wasn't something that you built into uh, the calculation of the five-year uh, land supply. Uh, 
Uh, that case is a sign stand it subject to an outstanding appeal um, to uh, appeal. Eastley, the final of the cases on, on 73. Um, obviously, if there's no five-year land supply, the NPPF deems relevant policies to be out of date. But this case establishes that this is a, a one-way consideration um, in relation to five-year land supply, the way the court put it. So the inspector is not required to take into account the fact that there is a five-year land supply in deciding what weight to give to policies in the development plan. In this case, it was about countryside policies. Um, the weight that one gave um, to, to the fact that five-year uh, land supply was for the inspector, subject to Wensbury, and any failure to give any weight to the fact that there was a five-year land supply when considering what weight to give to the relevant policies was not ir irrational. Then paragraph 79, city and country, uh, deal with this one uh, quite briefly. This is about isolated homes in the countryside. Uh, it looked at some uh, obiter dicta in a couple of other Court of Appeal cases, Braintree and, and Dartford. Um, two arguments. One was that there was some kind of previously developed land exception to the policy uh, against isolated homes in the countryside. Uh, and then in addition, an argument which I think I would probably describe as ambitious, that the number of intended houses that you're proposing uh, can remove uh, the application of paragraph 79. There is also an outstanding appeal uh, in relation to that case as well as I understand. Can I then finally just turn to uh, Flynn um, Annex 2, because there uh, what Mr Justice Dove told us was that uh, affordable housing is a portmanteau term which comprises a number of potential kinds of tenure. Well, what do we learn from that? Well, I suppose, first of all, you learn something every day, because I had no idea until I looked up in the dictionary um, what a portmanteau actually was. Um, it's some form of old fashioned large traveling bag that looks like a sort of portable wardrobe and chest of drawers. Um, secondly, I don't know whether this tells us that um, perhaps judges have still got some work to do in making sure that the terms they use are uh, within the modern world, and I'll obviously raise that with Justice Carmichael when I next see him. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to hand over uh, to uh, Hannah, uh, and Hannah's going to be dealing, as I said earlier, with um, Greenbelt after Samuel Smith. Thanks, James. Um, as James said in his introduction, Samuel Smith is a recent Supreme Court case in which I acted for North Yorkshire County Council with our colleague at Landmark, Dan Kalinsky QC. The key issue in Samuel Smith was the meaning of that rather elusive concept, openness in the Greenbelt. In particular, the relationship between openness and visual impact. Samuel Smith involved mineral extraction in the Greenbelt and so will be of particular interest for those in minerals planning. But the case has a broad application to Greenbelt in general and indeed for planning as a whole. I'm often asked about the extent to which I think this case has changed the status quo. And I think the answer is in pure legal terms, um, not much. Um, and indeed, um, at paragraph 23, Lord Carnworth remarked um, that it seems surprising in retrospect that the relationship between openness and visual impact has sparked such legal controversy. Having said that, I think it provides extremely useful guidance and clarification for decision makers, applicants and interested parties alike on what exactly openness in the Greenbelt is. Um, and I think these next slides too really show how passionate people are about the green belt. I mean, you'll all you'll all be aware of this, even if it is somewhat misunderstood um, as a policy. So, I mean, that's probably why it's litigated so much. So, in my talk today, I'm going to take you through some of what I believe are the most important points to take away from this case. Let's briefly try and understand first how and where this judgment might be relevant. Openness is the backbone of Greenbelt policy. At a basic level, openness is defined as an essential characteristic of Greenbelt. And I've put the key uh, paragraphs from the MPPF there. 
The concept of openness is also crucial to plan making, for example, demonstrating the necessity of new green belts or defining new green belt boundaries. When it comes to development control decisions, the concept of openness appears in multiple policies. First, one needs to understand openness to ascertain whether development is inappropriate or appropriate or potentially appropriate in the green belt. The significance, as you'll all know, is that inappropriate development is by definition harmful to the green belt and should not be approved except in very special circumstances, a concept which the MPPF expands on in paragraph 144. If the development in question is a building which is prima facie inappropriate, several of the development types in the closed category of exceptions in Para 145 depend on whether openness is harmed or not. And I've placed those there on, this, on the slide. And paragraph 146 provides that certain other forms of development are also not inappropriate in the green belt provided they preserve its openness and do not conflict with the purposes of including land within it. The first of those, mineral extraction, was an issue in Samuel Smith. And finally, where development is inappropriate, it's essential to determine exactly how and to what extent openness is harmed when weighing up whether very special circumstances exist. So moving on to the case of Samuel Smith, what was the case about? The permission being challenged was for an extension to the operational face of Jackdaw Crag Quarry, a limestone quarry owned and operated by the third respondent, Darrington Quarries. The existing quarry, which extends to about 25 hectares and has been in use since the 1940s, is in the Greenbelt, about one and a half kilometres to the southwest of the nearest large settlement in Tadcaster. The proposed extension was for an area of about six hectares and was proposed to use the existing structures and access on site. It wasn't in dispute between the parties that there would be a number of visual effects caused by the extension. And the council's landscape architect had noted a number of things that I've put on the slide there. Samuel Smith was particularly bothered about the long distance views being cut off. They were arguing that even after the quarry had been worked um, and restored, the resulting landform would mean that the area was no longer open. Even though in development terms, after restoration, there would be absolutely nothing on the land. It was going to be an area of grass by and large. Samuel Smith's argument in court was therefore that North Yorkshire Council had erred in failing to treat the visually, visual effects of the development as a material consideration in its application of the openness proviso under paragraph 90, now a paragraph 146. In other words, they argued that visual impact needed to be considered by the council, um, not just, for example, when thinking about landscape or visual amenity, but specifically through the prism of openness, um, rather confusing and convoluted there. What this really amounted to and what the court gave short shrift to was that this was a requirement to keep the land visually unencumbered, but as we all know, the green belt has contours, it has vegetation, it has buildings. So, it, you know, in my view, and I'm biased, this argument didn't make much sense. So what did the court decide? The key finding is at paragraph 39, where Lord Carnworth said, the issue which had to be addressed was whether the proposed mineral extraction would preserve the openness of the green belt or otherwise conflict with the purposes of including the land within the green belt. Those issues were specifically identified and addressed in the report. There was no error of law on the face of the report. Paragraph 90 does not expressly refer to visual impact as a necessary part of the analysis nor in my view is it made so by implication. As explained in my discussion of the authorities, 
The matters relevant to openness in any particular case are a matter of planning judgment, not law. So this is consistent with Lord Carnwell's previous judgment in Hopkins Holmes, very much about stripping this case back to its facts. This is a case about application, not interpretation. Nevertheless, I think there are five key points of general applicability that I think we can usefully take away from this judgment. The first is that Lord Carnworth confirmed very clearly, applying Tesco and Dundee and Hopkins Homes, that the concept of openness is a broad policy concept. What does this mean in practical terms? It means that it's for the decision maker to decide on the facts of any given case, which factors are relevant when considering whether openness is preserved. It's only if the decision maker has failed to consider a factor that was so obviously material as to require direct consideration that there will be scope for the court to intervene. So in my view, this should give decision makers a fair degree of confidence that their judgments on openness should not be interfered with unless they have gone fairly seriously wrong. Secondly, and importantly, this judgment puts to bed a significant amount of confusion that had been generated by previous case law, particularly the case of Turner, about whether decision makers were required to consider the visual aspect of openness as distinct from its spatial aspect. That's to say the mere presence of development in the green belt. The clear answer from the case is no, they are not required to do so, but they may do so if it is relevant. As Alistair mentioned in his talk, Lord Carnworth considered Greenbelt policy, including from a historical perspective, and that was very much a focus in the hearing and in his judgment, and concluded very clearly that the visual quality of the landscape is not in itself an essential part of the openness for which the Greenbelt is protected. And I've put some other findings to that effect on the slide. In my view, this restores a lot of much needed common sense to this area. The judges in the hearing were quick to point out uh, that most Greenbelt comprises working landscapes that are neither pristine nor undisturbed. Um, for example, plant nurseries, sports fields and storage yards. Um, or in the case of North Yorkshire, where Lady Hale, very helpfully for our case, lives, uh, the Greenbelt is littered with open cast mines. It's a feature of the Greenbelt there. Um, I was thinking of doing a sort of have I got news for you style quiz, Greenbelt or not Greenbelt, just to spice up your lockdown. Um, but for now, I'll show you a couple of choice images of Greenbelt that prove this point. So yes, this is in the Greenbelt. Um, Similarly, green belt. Um, as these images show, and as the court confirmed, a green belt policy doesn't require the designated areas to be of high landscape quality or even remotely attractive. Pre this judgment, my experience was that decision makers were often relying on a dichotomy of spatial impact on the one hand and visual impact on the other. I don't think this really makes much sense um, and blurs the notion of green belt designation with landscape designation. Post Samuel Smith, that's not the correct approach and openness should be looked at more holistically. Having said that, the judgment makes clear that sometimes visual or implicitly visual matters will be relevant to the consideration of the effect on openness. So I've tried to think of some examples here. One is with mineral, mineral operations. Despite Samuel Smith's argument that the council had ignored visual impact, a key factor for the planning officer in concluding openness was preserved was the fact that the site was temporary and was subject to a restoration management plan. This was provided for in the 106. And this was pretty stringent actually. It included the requirement for the employment of a landscape architect qualified in mineral restoration projects specifically. It also included agreement of the contours of the mine among other provisions. 
And so there's necessarily going to be a visual aspect to that when we're thinking about restoration, as the Supreme Court rightly recognised. Another example that springs to mind for me is where the proposed development is in the setting of a historic town. Once again, the notion of setting, to my mind, has a visual element to it at least. Finally, another example might be where proposed development is particularly close to the Greenbelt urban boundary. A decision maker might there legitimately consider how urbanising the development is when determining if it's contributing to urban sprawl. And this will often have a visual element to it. Which leads me on to my fourth point. Another aspect of the judgment that I think is really important, again, really sensible, and that I think hasn't been picked up so much in the commentary so far, is the idea that openness is a counterpart to urban sprawl. Now that sounds obvious, but Lord Carnworth went back to basics, again looked at the historical context, and emphasised that this is the fundamental purpose of the Green Belt. Now I think this is a really practical and easily understood way of understanding and thinking about openness. And if we think about the genesis of Greenbelt policy. Many of you will know that it was formally adopted to control the rapid growth of post-war housing estates around existing towns. It's not about openness or absence of development per se. There was a reason for the adoption of Greenbelt policy. And when we think of it like this, it becomes clear, therefore, exactly why the developments I listed earlier that are subject to the openness proviso in paragraphs 145 and 146 have been included in that policy. They are all types of development that are not deemed necessarily inappropriate, that's to say leading to urban sprawl, either because of their nature or because they're necessarily found in greenbelt locations. So in the context of mineral extraction, the court highlighted that it's generally temporary it can be restored and minerals can only be worked where they're found. And indeed, Lord Carnworth even went one step further and made the point that as a barrier to urban sprawl, a quarry may be regarded in Greenbelt policy terms as no less effective than a stretch of agricultural land. Once we understand this, we can see why it didn't matter that the quarry wasn't visually attractive. Because actually a quarry, particularly one like in this case, with minimal buildings and structures associated with it, could arguably be keeping land almost as open as unencumbered countryside. Finally, I want to leave you with some reflections on this judgment and perhaps tentatively relate this to the COVID-19 world. Uh, Lord Carnworth used this case as somewhat of a parting shot before he left the Supreme Court to emphasise two things in terms of the court's role in planning. Once again, he emphasised the proper distinction between planning policy application and interpretation. And secondly, he emphasised that officers' reports must be read fairly and as a whole and not subject to analysis as if they were some kind of contract. And sadly, I think these points take on an even greater resonance um, in a world where judges will uh, potentially be harsher on weak cases or ones that are in reality attacking the merits of planning judgment. Um, so that concludes my talk. Um, many thanks for listening to us today and I hope our whistle stop tour of MPPF updates has been useful. Um, now we have a few minutes to answer some of the questions that you've posed in the Q&A. Um, so I'll hand back to um, Rupert and the rest of the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Hannah. Uh, and thanks to all the, the speakers. We've had um, 13, 14, 15 plus questions, some of which overlap over the course of the, the presentations. And I think um, let's try and, and answer uh, a few of them in the next 10-15 um, minutes or so. As I said at the beginning, if we don't get to your question, apologies, but we'll, we'll try and pick up any, particularly the more difficult ones you can imagine later on, rather than answering them now. Um, I've had some uh, 
vol volunteers from among the speaker panel to pick up the questions. But if I if I just go through a number of them and we'll see we we'll see how we do. Um, the first was a question about uh, from Janine Laver about terms other than uh, terms that you find written in the NPPF, terms like moderate and substantial and how they might feature in a tilted balance. It really arose, Alistair, during, during your, your talk. Do, do you yeah. want to say something about, uh, as it were, um, uh, homegrown expressions or expressions yeah. that are used in the context of tilted balance that, that aren't in the document itself? Yes, uh, thanks very much. And thank you, Janine, for, for an interesting question. Um, the, the point which uh, was made uh, in, uh, in, in the case I was uh, uh, referring to on that topic is, uh, is essentially about whether or not terms which are being used, um, terms which are being used are in the, um, are in the framework themselves. But that's not to say that a decision maker uh, can't say, okay, well, I'm considering the weight to be given to this, and I think it should be uh, given considerable in weight or, or, or important weight or a lot of weight. Um, that's, that's completely fine in terms of structuring a, a um, discretion or structuring a decision. But uh, what was particularly important in terms of heritage policies is uh, that um, saying that um, um, harm, saying that harm, um, saying there's substantial harm or less than substantial harm, that itself has consequences according to the NPVF policies as set out in uh, paragraphs 193 to 196. What was key was to recognise that actually um, the, the, the term, um, uh, the, the, the term modest weight or negligible weight or, or whatever the officer report had said, that, that itself didn't feature in the NPPF and so it couldn't, it couldn't reflect how the NPPF itself applied, but that's not to say that, the deci that a decision maker when applying or when applying uh, the NPPF or, in, or when uh, applying the tilted balance, for instance, can't say, I think this, this has considerable weight or important weight or, or terms which aren't in the NPPF, so long as they recognise that, that there are no policy consequences which flow directly from that because they are not terms in the framework itself. And... Great. Thank you very much, Alistair. It's, it's um, linked to a question that we also had about... Um, the different weight to be given to the MPPF and the MPPG or the PPG, which I think also arose um, in the course of your, your paper, Alistair. I mean, I, I know that judges are, are often very in, interested. I can remember um, Mr. Justice Dove being very keen on this topic in the fracking litigation, also in the, the JR to the adoption of the MPPF itself. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I don't know whether any of the panelists have a, a different view than the framework is policy fully consulted on higher status, MPPG as guidance, but how much weight you give to a particular point in a particular case is shielded by the, um, uh, the general rule of the courts that weight is for the decision maker. Is there general agreement on that? I think I'd essentially agree with that. Uh, and one, one phrase which we um, often see in the cases is that uh, policy in the NPPF is supplemented by policy in the PPG. Uh, Lord Justice Lindblom, uh, for instance, um, often uh, uses that term, as I recall it. Um, as a matter of public law, uh, I, I, I suppose that the, the Secretary of State can uh, change his or her policy um, by expressing it at any time as he or she wishes. So I can't, uh, in itself, I can't see a reason why it would be illegal to try and change policy in the NPPF through the PPG, but I can't see that would ever happen. Um, directly uh, because of uh, because Rupert as you say the higher status um, the uh, consultation etc 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 so yes um, but that said you're, you're absolutely totally right I, and I completely agree that the weight to be given to different considerations uh, including if there's more specific consideration of something in the PPG the weight to be given uh, is a matter for the decision maker uh, as, as always. Yes there's a, there's a question there that I might um offer James the chance to comment on about how much weight should be given to the reasoning of Mr Justice Holgate in his decisions, given what sometimes happens to his decisions in the Court of Appeal. I mean, I, I say that as a joke, but it's, there is a point in there, isn't there, James, about how much weight to be given to High Court decisions when they're on appeal? Well, I, I guess so. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll avoid any direct comment about um, <laughs> that particular um, But, um, I mean, I think... Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's part of our system that, uh, you know, 
high court decisions can be appealed. Um, you know, even the best judges get overturned on appeal on occasion. Um, I think um, if you read Ronald Dworkin's Empire of Law, he creates the mythical judge Hercules, who's near perfect, but still gets overturned on appeal. So I, I think, you know, you have to bear in mind that if, if you look at how many cases Mr Justice Holgate's decided um, since you know, he became uh, a judge, and the fact that he's presided over the planning court, he's been overturned on relatively few occasions. There are a number of judges like him, Mr Justice Dove, who I think we can give great weight to their decisions because they are deciding these things day in and day out. I mean, I would just say, I mean, when I was looking at some of these cases, I was quite surprised that a few of those cases had, that I talked about have been given permission to appeal. And, and I think there is a bit of an issue that the Court of Appeal is taking on too many cases on the interpretation of the NPPF. Um, now, great for lawyers, great for workload, but actually, is it sensible? I'm, I'm not so sure. No, no, I'm with you, James. Uh, I say that notwithstanding the fact that I'm now representing Peel in the Court of Appeal in, <laughs> in, in the Peel case. Um, but yes, I mean, you're, you're right. The filter, as people will know, particularly those whose decisions are being challenged by claimants in the court, the filter between the High Court and the Court of Appeal maybe isn't quite as robust as, as, as it should be, but, but there we are. I mean, can, can I just link that last question about reasoning of judges to an interesting point that somebody raised about um, the step-by-step -step approach in the case law to the presumption paragraphs? Because, because certainly some of the ways that it's put, particularly by David Holgate, um, even though there's a potted summary, as David Blundell said in his, in his talk, is quite difficult to follow. And, and somebody raises the question about the extent to which that's really, that step-by-step -step approach is really being followed in committee reports by local authorities. I mean, I'll trap my view in first of all. Uh, I haven't seen many examples, if any, of um, a step-by-step -step approach in quite the, the legal way that David Holgate m might prefer. Um, partly, of course, because it's risky to make your committee report as legal or legalistic as that. I don't know whether anybody else has had any uh, experience of um, local authorities responding to these cases in their committee reports in recent months. No, I mean, it, and saying this does remind me of something which was said uh, in relation, um, I think it was the Calverton case back on in Greenbelt um, uh, in the uh, original NPPF, where Lord Justice Jay, uh, uh, sorry, Mr Justice Jay set out uh, really quite a regimented way of dealing with the concept of exceptional circumstances for amending Greenbelt boundaries. Um, through local plan review, and he said, well, you know, here's, here's the way to do it, but this is a council of perfection, uh, and that may well be uh, the, the, uh, the way to approach what we see in, in the Monk Hill decision, for instance, that um, as a matter of law, this might be the absolutely most per perfect dotted, I'd, dotted I's and crossed T's way of doing it, but that doesn't mean that in the real world of practical decision making and committee reports that, that necessarily has to be done that way. Well, I think that's right, because as soon as somebody does it, and it isn't exactly the same as we find set out in, in the Monk Hill decision in the court, then somebody challenges it. And then the next thing you have is the court, maybe even Mr. Justice Holgate himself saying, I wasn't intending to lay out a strict procedure that has to be followed in every case. And so one has to bear that kind of point in mind when um, trying to apply these, these decisions in the High Court. Um, let's just press on. I want to cover another few things before we leave it, before we wrap it up. Some points about the, um, the five-year housing land supply cases, James. That there's a, a, a couple of questions about sh shortfall and also a point about um, whether the current COVID-19 crisis is likely to, f I'll put it very broadly, feature in debates in the next um, year or so about whether there's a five-year housing land supply. Would you, would you touch on that one, maybe? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure, I'm, I'm absolutely sure that it will feature um, in many, many an inquiry, uh, if, if there are any, of course, um, <laughs> uh, in relation to whether you can demonstrate a five-year land supply. But of course, I mean, the, the tests um, in the MPPF um, as to, you know, what, what you can count in the five-year land supply hasn't changed, hasn't been changed, uh, at least at the moment. Um, and so, um, I mean, where, whereas one can have regard to what's happened in the crisis, I'm not sure it kind of provides any solution or different approach. You're still asking the same questions around deliverability, 
uh, etc that you would be asking in any other in any other situation i don't know whether rupert you've got any further view on that no i think that's right i mean there has been a one well publicized um decision letter hasn't there by an inspector about three weeks ago um taking into account the likely impact on delivery of, of covid19 and reaching a conclusion about whether there's a five-year supply in the end it's a it's a, a real life factor which on the evidence may well be may well may well be relevant so i can i could definitely see it f featuring i mean i think it's more um complicated when you get into cases where you're looking at the five-year supply and there's the standard methodology uh, to be being used um, there is a question uh, that somebody's raised about what happens in standard methodology cases to the to the shortfall that we always used to enjoy so much arguing about um, when looking at whether there was a five-year housing land supply shortfall. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I mean, my view, James, is that um, the standard methodology is intended on day one going forward for the five years to obviate the need to look at the um, shortfall. In other words, one doesn't take into account the shortfall in the five-year case based on the standard methodology. But I know, I don't know what your experience is, um, that there have been differences of approach, I know, by some authorities. Yeah, well, I, think that, I think that probably is right. Um, uh, I think that is the intention. Um, I suspect there probably is still some room and scope for argument about that, though. Yes, I think that's right. I, can I can I just raise a couple of points that people have have uh, asked about on Green Belt, um, Hannah? Um, that somebody raises the question about whether just just the clarification really about whether loss of a loss of a view or loss of views is really mm. an impact on openness or not. Well, what, what do you make of that? Um, well, I think um, per se, the effect of Samuel Smith is, is no. You know, that was really what Samuel Smith were arguing in court. And I think um, it might be helpful for anyone who's still confused to look at paragraph five of the judgment. I didn't have time to sort of go into it in real depth today. But what Lord Carnworth does there is he goes back through the previous policy and in particular, he looks at PPG2, so the previous policy for Greenbelt. Um, and what the Greenbelt policy used to do more clearly than the MPPF, which is obviously more of a concise statement of policy, um, is that it set out the fundamental aim of Greenbelt policy to prevent urban sprawl, to contain um, urban centres. And then once land had been allocated to the Greenbelt, it set out objectives for the use of that land. Um, so that included providing opportunities for access and retaining and enhancing attractive landscapes. So you can see the sort of um, uh, where that leads to in terms of the MPPF today, paragraph 141 I'm thinking of in particular. But I think what has happened is that there's been some confusion between the reasons for allocating land as green belts and then the objectives for that land once allocated. You know, visual quality comes into what we do with green belt, but it's not a reason for allocating it in the first place, which is why you have Lord Carnworth saying, look, visual, the visual aspect can be relevant, but it's not really the key thing. It's about whether we're containing urban sprawl or not. So I hope that that, that clarifies things slightly um yes. you know th and, th thank you Helen. yes yeah I, I can i just ask you while you're uh, uh while you're speaking just to pick up one other short point um i don't know whether what lay behind this question was a particular um case it often is isn't it where things are not maybe going the right way but somebody asks whether in relation to paragraph 134 the five purposes which are obviously there in ppg um, two and PPS two for many years. Um, whether whether local authorities, when they're looking at allocating housing sites, can quote just ignore one or more of those purposes in relation to land. Now, I don't know what you think, Hannah, about that. Um, well, I'm not sure if, if the rest of the panel would agree, but I mean, I, I I don't think that would be wise. Not least that that's policy there that you know has to be considered, um, but. In particular, because Lord Carnworth, what he made quite clear is that those purposes aren't sort of distinct from the fundamental aim of 
preventing urban sprawl, they feed into it, you know, so in a way you can look at paragraphs 133 or 134 holistically, you know, and obviously in any given case, then there might be situations where, for whatever reason, you know, one of those sub points in paragraph 1341 or more doesn't apply, um, unless it's quite clear that they don't. I mean, I would think a more comprehensive approach is, is always advisable. I don't know if the rest of the panel agrees. Yeah, I, I think, I, I'm, for my part, I think that's, that's right. Obviously, you can, in a particular case, maybe not focus on uh, one of the one of the purposes if it's not relevant or not important but plainly when you're doing a comprehensive exercise in relation to the land you should look at all of them yeah. um, in the first instance I'm sure that's yeah. right let me let me just um, we're, we're running out of time but let me just um, take up a, another couple of quick points um, because we've had a number now getting on for 30 interesting interesting questions um, one of them is is when the next version of the MPPF might be published which might resolve um, or clarify matters and you, you, you can I just offer some thoughts on that first of all I just stress I, I'm not I'm not involved uh, in any such revision but uh, you'll remember the change between July 2018 and the 2019 version of the MPPF was presaged or, or badged as a technical um, clarification of, of the document even though it made some quite important changes to the 2018 July version of the, of the document. I think that sets the um, precedent for incremental changes to the uh, framework. And I, and I know um, that the um, post-election Conservative government certainly had in mind some um, housing-led, um, business-led changes to the, to the framework that it wanted to do during 2020. Now, obviously, in the current situation, they may well not happen um, because there are other important things that government is uh, is concerned with but I, I I don't know what others think I've no doubt that um, in in the course of time perhaps in the next 12 months um, there will be some changes to the framework and one can see pressure through uh, the development industry on government to make things easier as we come out of the COVID-19 crisis may itself lead to some changes first in the MPPG and then maybe in the MPPF I don't know a lot of this, others think about that. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd probably agree with that, Ruth. But I, I, one thing I found quite interesting about the NPPF as compared to the PPG is that it didn't change. From 2012, it didn't change until 2018. But yeah. now it seems to me possibly that, you know, um, the dam has cracked in terms of the, P, the NPPF can be changed. And, and I, I think we'll see that coming um, forward. Uh, more, more, more rapidly. And my recollection from uh, planning for the future uh, is that that suggested, um, or, uh, or the suite of announcements in relation to planning for the future suggested amendments to the NPPF, including in, um, once again uh, referring to design and, uh, and you know, uh, the importance of design and, and beauty. Um, so yes, I, I'd agree. I, I think we can see that coming in due course. Uh, of course, you know, um, other uh, government has other priorities at the moment, but towards the back end of the year maybe or, or, or early in 2021 we may see these things coming back on stream. There was, there was a high profile refusal wasn't there this week by the Secretary of State on, on design grounds Yes. Um, and um, one, one might take the view they've got enough tools already to do that but I suspect that won't stop the changes being, being made and um, of course every time it's changed you open up a whole new raft of interpretation issues, a whole new raft of cases which as we said earlier um, not just the High Court, but the Court of Appeal seem willing to take on each time. That's right. And the, and the Court of Appeal, of course, is still deciding and has decided some cases about versions of the MPPF, which by the time they've decided it are already out of date. And so yeah. they're, um, they'll, they'll start refusing, I suspect, if, if, these, if there are more changes more quickly, um, deciding some of these interpretation points if they think they're uh, academic. But I think that to, to wrap up, can I say thank you very much to uh, all of our speakers, including David, of course, who's, who's not with us live, unless his case is finished and is watching. Uh, thank you very much to, to all of my fellow speakers and to those at Landmark who have um, uh, contributed to putting this webinar together. Thank you very much indeed for listening. And can I just stress again that um, we've had, getting on for 30 questions, some of which we've attempted uh, to answer for you. We'll try and pick up some of the other more, more detailed points
that I've seen in the questions in a short paper for you, which will get out as soon as possible. But um, uh, as they say these days, keep, uh, keep well. Thank you very much indeed for um, uh, listening and watching. Uh, and we look forward to welcoming you again to the next of our landmark webinars. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.